My name is Sean Kelly. Uh, I teach in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program here. <coughs> and it's, my, uh, it's been my pleasure to uh, chair um, Adrian's dissertation, which we'll all hear about in, in a few minutes. I just wanted to give you a little idea of how, how we're going to proceed. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about the nature of the defense. Uh, then Adrian will uh, give a summary of his research for approximately 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes. Uh, then the members of the committee, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, will have a chance to engage Adrian in some dialogue uh, around the, um, the substance of the dissertation as well as any other matters that might have come up during the presentation. So the members of the committee are, first of all, myself, uh, Craig Chalquist, who is, has recently uh, stepped into the position of chair of the East-West Psychology here at CIS. Uh, prior to that, he taught at JFK University uh, and is still an associate of JFK as well as Pacifica Graduate Institute. He's the author of Terra Psychology, uh, Re-Engaging the Soul of Place, uh, as well as the editor of several volumes on eco-psychology, eco-therapy, and many articles. Very productive uh, man. We're lucky to have him here. Okay. Very grateful that you're on the committee. And the external reader is Chris Chappell, uh, who we're also very honored to have on this committee. And I'm going to read a very brief bio here. Since um, I don't know you well enough, Chris, I hope that changes <coughs> at some point. But here it is. <laughs> Uh, Christopher Chapel is the Navin and Pratima Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology at Loyola Marymount University. Chris received his undergraduate degree in Comparative Literature and Religious Studies from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, and his doctorate in the History of Religions through the Theology Department at Fordham University. He served as Assistant Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies of World Religions and taught Sanskrit, Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism for five years at the State University of New York at Stony Brook before joining the faculty at LMU. Chris's research interests have focused on the renouncer religious traditions of India, yoga, Jainism, and Buddhism. He has published several books, including Karma and Creativity, a co-translation of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and Nonviolence to Animals, Earth, and Self in Asian Traditions, Hinduism and Ecology, a co edited volume, Jainism and Ecology, Nonviolence in the Web of Life, and Reconciling Yogas. So it's a, a very impressive um, uh, encapsulation of a distinguished career. Uh, and once you hear more from Adrian about the nature of dissertation, you'll understand how uh, delighted we were that Chris agreed to be the external reader and to match uh, a better fit for, for the committee. So <clears throat> just a couple of words about the defense. The word itself suggests uh, a battle, an attack, <laughs> and uh, that is the traditional mode for defense. Uh, the di dissertation defense is the culminating ritual of the doctorate uh, degree where the candidate is supposed to demonstrate his competence and mastery of the chosen field uh, and uh, do two things. One, to author a dissertation and to demonstrate, not only in the dissertation but in the defense, that he can speak authoritatively on that topic. So being an author and speaking with authority are both linked to this rite of passage of becoming a doctor, uh, which really means just somebody who's learned Doctor. Yeah. And it's a tradition that's been going on for almost a thousand years. Started off, started in the first universities in Paris and Italy. And in the initial, some of the earliest defenses in Paris, uh, the authorities had to issue an edict at one point that members of the audience, uh, including the committee, were no longer allowed to bring in daggers. <laughs> uh, because uh, very uh, heated discussions would break out and sometimes uh, violent. Uh, altercations. <laughs> now, we at CIS like to think that we're cultivating a, a, a new way of approaching these things. Uh, we're not interested in, in attack, 
but we are interested, especially at this, during this critical rite of passage, to allow the candidate to demonstrate their authority, their competence, and they can only do that if the committee members are also willing to engage her or him uh, in a serious and direct way. So we will do that today, uh, albeit in a loving manner, uh, as we're used to doing at CIS. All right, so Adrian will now give his uh, presentation. There will be some dialogue between the committee members and Adrian, after which <clears throat> the committee will withdraw uh, and deliberate on uh, how Adrian did. And we'll come back and announce our verdict. And uh, the verdict can take one of three forms. Uh, the worst case scenario is that um, the dissertation is not good enough. That almost never happens. Clearly, we don't think that it's possible at this point because we've all read the dissertation. We think it's good enough to, to have come to this point. However, it is possible that, that the candidate during the defense can reveal something about their knowledge of the material which could invalidate the document itself, or at the very least, could demonstrate that they're not competent to stand, uh, to, to um, uh, manifest the truth and the authority of their position, in which case the defense could be a failure. So that is a real possibility. It has happened a couple of times in our program even, uh, unfortunately, in, over the last 10 years. I'm fairly confident that won't happen. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> the, other, the other possibility is that the defense uh, is successful. Uh, and that there are, uh, however, some revisions to be made, either based upon the final reading of the text, which we have just done, uh, or based upon the performance during this defense, where something might be revealed that we see needs attending to. The last possibility is simply uh, successful defense, text needs virtually no revisions, uh, and that's that. So, so you'll have to wait till the end to find that out. With this, I turn the floor over. Hi everyone. Oh, so, can you hear uh, Adrian there, Chris? I think I can. Uh, Adrian, can you say something again? Hey, how are you doing? Okay, very good. All right. We might need to speak up a little bit. Okay. Um, so I'm there's a problem that I'm tackling with this dissertation, which is the um, global ecological crisis. It's a problem that is not only ecological in nature, but it like trickles down Oops. Uh, <laughs> through different spheres of human endeavor, psychological, emotional, um, physical, social, and even spiritual. Um, so, in thinking what's the best approach for that, um, many thinkers believe that it's advisable to see it as a crisis of human consciousness. That the root of that external decimation that we see happening in the earth is found within the human mind. So from that approach, um, then my thesis follows the question. It's, um, if we see the ecological crisis as a crisis of human consciousness, what is it that we have to do or tend in order to, get, to gain an increased sense of intimacy and belonging to the earth? What do we have to do to envision planetary healing? So that's, those are the, the driving forces of the work. Um, so the way I went about doing it is perhaps mostly aligned with something called chemical hermeneutics, uh, but gone green. That's to say, um, this is not a classical philological study of religion. It is um, a way of allowing the internal contents of the mind to play a part in the um, in the the research, so my own 
Um, intuitions, dreams, meditations, contemplations play a key part in the work. Um, and I drew elements from uh, parapsychological inquiry when one enters into dialogue with the spirit of place of the, or the subjectivity um, of a particular land. And from Gerthen phenomenology, which is to say, sort of like an empathetic view uh, and a direct experiential approach to the um, object of study. This, is, this was supported by uh, integrative scholarship, which is to say bringing different fields of study, um, always from the point of view uh, of eco-psychology, which is the study, the psychological study of our relation to the earth. So I did um, many meditations and rituals and things, and I came up with things like this to try to give voice um, what I was getting into. So through these um, experiments, the elements came into being, and they serve as organizing forces of the whole uh, endeavor. So what I'm going to do now is to briefly, and hopefully succinctly and clearly, take you through the different chapters of the dissertation to give you some sort of like a bird's eye view of what I try to do. <coughs> And now pay close attention to what I believe is the original contribution of the study, which is kind of like halfway through. So initially, I laid out a concept, uh, the context in which the study unfolded, which I've told you already a little bit about it, which is the global ecological crisis or go hand-in-hand hand with uh, a planetization of the human. Um, so there's been different notions to address this sort of like global presence of, of our human species. Um, one is mainly the planetary era, <coughs> which started, said to have started a few hundred years ago, when um, exchange between the different continents was set. Exchange of, of diseases, of, of material goods, of communication. Um, another notion is the psychozoic era, which alludes to the powers of the mind as the main driver of this planetization of humankind. Another notion is that of the ecozoic, ecozoic era, alluding to uh, the human becoming fully transparent to, ideally, the Earth. And um, from there, I go a little bit into this, the history of eco-psychology um, and come with four or five metaphors that have been used to describe the disconnection, the dislocation between humans and the Earth. And that I propose a way in which I believe um, those metaphors can gain a little bit more clarity and application through the notion of eco-psychic ailment. Um, and the main difference, I would say, between what I'm doing and what I've studied as a background is that the explicit inclusion of not only a psychological study, but aiming at a multi-level study of our relation to the Earth, informed and grounded uh, in religious and spiritual traditions. So um, in the next chapter, I went into uh, an exploration of what is 
known as an anthropocosmic vision, anthropos, human and cosmos, order, arrangement, or, or the world itself. And it's pretty much based on, um, it's, it's said that it's, this approach is found throughout many religious traditions. And um, perhaps one of its main characteristics is that the religious experience is based on the permeability between the human and the cosmos. That rapport, that state of like belonging, where like fields fall apart and we encounter the sacred. And we are that, and that is us. Um, so from that, I go into the yoga tradition in particular to find examples for this, and the Buddhist tradition. And from that, I um, formulate one of the core notions of the study, which is this one. Uh, so inspired in this anthropocosmic vision, I, um, it's, it's kind of like an extension of uh, two already formulated notions. One is of the Earth community of Thomas Berry, and another one is of Marco Pogatnik, um, Earth Cosmos. So with this, I'm trying to hone in this anthropocosmic vision. How would that look in our relation to the Earth? In the next chapter, I use the elements some, of some sort of like anthropocosmic complexes or avenues. That's just only a technical way of, of uh, alluding to these first principles, as the word element suggests, as a guise of connection, I call them, as, as guides that can uh, take us from a, a dislocation that the eco-psychology sustains that industrial societies live in to, to a more transparent and permeable relation to the earth. Um, in a way, so when we say like a crisis of human consciousness, it seems too vast. It seems rather abstract. It seems like where do we start? And so the elements are there to help us like, oh, you can start here. Here, here, here. So I use um, an Eastern uh, approach for this, which is to say that I use five elements, not four. So earth, water, fire, air, and space, or ether or akasha. Uh, 